this morning, and we're going to be having sort of a standalone message. Last Sunday, I finished up looking at the issue of the Day of Christ. I think I said last Sunday that that was the sixth study, but I think there were only five. So in addition to not being able to read, I can't count. So I'm not, uh, I don't know that I'm anybody that anybody should be listening to about too much of anything, frankly, most of the time. But anyway, all that being said, we want to welcome our live stream uh, audience. And um, I just want to remind everybody quick, uh, David, if you could please give me just a tablet for a brief second. I just want to make another quick announcement about this. This thing launched last week, and this is the gracelifepress.com website. Uh, we're still working on interfacing this with the church's website, but here is an online store that folks can order materials directly and have it sent to their uh, sent to their house. And so the church now has an online store for all of our printed materials, and so we're excited about that. Those of you who are joining us on the live stream or watching this after the fact, there will be a link to this in the description under this video if you are interested in that. So enough about that, David. You can take that away, and we're going to get started. Let's look first at Titus chapter 3. As I was saying a moment ago, in the last number of weeks, we were looking at the issue of the day of Christ, okay? And I finished that last Sunday, and then that that left me with this Sunday before I'm going to be gone. So I didn't really want to start anything big new and then be gone right away after I start something new. So I started thinking, what what should we do with, with this Sunday, okay? And sometimes, I'll be honest with you, I like these sort of one, one timers because they give me an opportunity to just sort of talk about something that's on my mind. And one of the things that is on my mind is the fact that we, let's just get to verse, get Titus 3, verse 7, Titus 3, verse 7, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now look at verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm how often? continually, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time. We're grateful for your word. We pray as we look at some examples, we look at a practical example out of the Old Testament of the need to rightly divide the word of truth. We pray that we'll have clarity and understanding from your word about this. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. What's been on my mind is that line there in verse 8. That line there in verse 8, where, where it says, look at the first uh, part of verse 8, Titus 3, 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm, how often? Constantly, okay? Now, you know, when I was a kid, let me just talk to you about my experience. When I was a kid growing up in a grace church, my dad was the preacher, all right? And you know how it is when you're the preacher's kid. You can talk to my own kids. I'm sure they'll tell you this. They hear a lot of preacher talk all the time, Okay? I'm on the phone, I'm talking to people about the Bible. People are, I'm, I'm typing, I'm talking to people about the Bible. You know, uh, Andrew and Daniel, they'll make fun of me often about how all, all I can talk about is Bollinger, Simonides, and Constantin Tischendorf, okay? And so they, uh, there, there's all these things. But I remember being in church and feeling like my dad often just was constantly talking about the same thing. And as a teenager, you know, you kind of have a bad attitude and you think that's boring and it's always the same things and, you know, why can't we talk about anything new and all that sort of thing, right? Hopefully that's not your attitude, but that was my attitude when I was a teenager. And as I've grown up and and been in ministry now for a number of years, verses like this strike me when he says there in verse 8, this is a faithful saying, these things I will that thou affirm how often? Constantly. You know what? There ought to be a little bit of repetition at church, okay? There ought to be a little bit of constant affirmation of things that we need to know and understand and believe. And the reason for that is because when you leave here, when you walk out of the door and you leave here, now hopefully this isn't your experience, okay? Uh, But for a lot of people, they leave church and they don't plug into the Word of God until the next time they come back to church, Okay, And when they go out into the world, they're constantly bombarded with politics and sports and, and uh, entertainment and fashion and you know on and on and on, all the different things that are out there, social media, regular media, all these different things, and you forget about the Word of God. And then you come back to a verse like this, and Paul is telling Titus in one of the pastoral epistles here, he's saying, these things I would that thou affirm, how often? Constantly, folks, we need to be reminded often of basic things. We need to be reminded of the truths that we should be holding in high regard in our thinking. Come with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. 
Now we have a series of, of sermons and every, all the sermons that we do, especially the last series on the issue of the day of Christ, you know, that was some heavy plowing at times. You know, really digging into the sort of the nitty gritty of issues related to the day of the Lord and the day of Christ and, and making comparisons, etc. But you need to understand that those things are based, those, those sort of deeper things, if I can call them that, are based upon smaller, less complicated things that they are scaffolded or built on top of, right? And we think about a verse like this, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 4, who will have all men to be what? Saved. Is it God's will that all men be saved? Yes, okay? Did Jesus Christ die on the cross to pay for all sin? Yes. But we know from Romans chapter 3 that, the, that salvation is offered unto all, but it is only upon all them that what? That believe, right? And so we understand that. But God's will is for all men to be saved. But then notice the end of verse 4, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So God wants you to be saved. Yes, that is his will. That is what God wants for every human being. He wants them to be, get saved. He wants them to hear the gospel. He wants them to embrace the truth of the simplicity of the gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sin, was buried, and rose again. And when we put faith in that and that alone as the only payment for our sin, he'll give you eternal life as a free gift. But he doesn't want it to stop there. That verse says, who will have all men to be saved and to do what? Come to the knowledge of the truth. Does he want you to grow? and mature, and be edified, and as, as you go through your life, as you go through the Christian life, so to speak, does he, or does he want you to remain just a little milk toast baby Christian your whole life, or does he want you to grow up and be edified, etc., okay, grow up into, in, into these things? So there's, a, there's two issues there when it comes to the will of God today in this dispensation. It's number one, who will have all men be saved, and number two, to come to the knowledge of the truth, right? Now here's what happens, though. I look around this audience and I see some people who have been here basically since the beginning, since we were at Apex, okay? I, I see other folks who are new, who have been here maybe less than three months. I see other folks who have been here maybe 10 years. And so we have all different uh, folks in here at all different sort of levels of understanding, of all different levels of maturity. I look at, you know, uh, Sister Darlene and, and you know, uh, having been married to Lee, She's been around this for a very long time, 50 years or more probably, right? And so everybody is at a different spot. But there's an issue there that we need to continually and constantly come back to the basics and come back to affirming things that we need to not lose sight of, okay? Come with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. The thing that I want to address then today, now there's a lot of things that could fit into that category, okay? The basic issues of uh, Rede uh, justification, forgiveness, redemption, those things are basic things. There's uh, issues about just basic Bible study, dispensational approach to Scripture. There's all sorts of things that we could fit into this category of things that need to be affirmed constantly. And I want to look with you at verse uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. One of the things that this church is based upon and that makes it different from other churches is the idea of rightly dividing the word of truth. The idea of dispensational Bible study. The idea of studying the Word of God the way God's Word says it should be studied, all right? Now, we've got 30-part we've got series on our website going through all the ins and outs of all of this. We've got one-timers. We one we've got one got all sorts of different things that are available on our church's website that talk about the issue of rightly dividing the Word of Truth and dispensational Bible study. But let's look at the verse, verse 15, study to show thyself. You understand that as a believer, you're only responsible for who? Yourself. Can you make your spouse study? Can your spouse make you study? Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman. You know, much the scriptures say that much study is a weariness to the flesh. So there's going to be some work involved in this, right? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Now look at the last part of that. Rightly dividing the word of what? The word of truth. So let me ask you just a few questions. According to that verse, would you surmise that there is a right way and a wrong way to study the word of truth? I would surmise that, right? Because it says you're to, do, you're to rightly divide what? The word of truth. So if you're to rightly divide the word of truth, then is it obviously conceivably possible to wrongly divide the word of truth? Okay? 
So we understand the word there that is translated rightly dividing in English, the word there in Greek is the word orthotomeo, which is where we get the idea of an orthopedic surgeon from, right? You think about a surgeon, and if you go to a skilled surgeon, they are, they are only going to make the number of cuts that are necessary to successfully accomplish the task or the purpose for which they are going into the surgery, right? Well, there's, a, there's an analogy there when it comes to the issue of the Word of God. We are to rightly divide the Word of truth. So there are some cuts, there are some divisions that we need to be making in the Word of God as we study to show ourselves approved unto God. Now, this is what the Bible says about itself. The Bible says about itself that we need to study, and that in studying, we need to rightly divide the Word of truth. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Now, the issue of right division is really the issue of dispensational Bible study. It is the issue of observing where God has put lines of demarcation in his word, okay, and that we should follow those. Now, when we think about right division, so some people will say, okay, yeah, we got the division part, but we want to do it right. So is it possible to underdivide? In other words, to not make enough divisions, to not acknowledge enough divisions, right? But is it also possible to overdivide, to make more divisions where God does not have divisions, right? And so we need to be cognizant of the idea of rightly dividing, dividing the Word of God, recognizing what is to us and for us in this dispensation of grace that we live in, but not doing, not going too far in that or not underdoing it, so to speak, right? And so people, they fall into either one of those things, and it is a very fine line to understand and to rightly divide the word of truth. Now, I am not going to stand here and say and claim ultimate infallibility for my understanding of the word of God and where I have drawn every line, okay? Because I have been wrong in the past, I'm sure I'm currently wrong about some things that I believe. If I come to realize that I'm wrong, I'll change my what? I'll change my mind, right? Nobody is infallible. Nobody except God Almighty and the Holy Spirit have perfect understanding of the Word of God, right? So that means we all need to be open then as believers to further instruction, to being taught the Word of God more perfectly, if you will, right? And we are all open and ought to be open to, to that instruction process, and none of us should come to a place where we think that we've arrived and we have perfect understanding, okay? Now, that said, I will say that when I teach the Word of God, I teach it to the best of my ability based upon my current what? Understanding, okay? If I thought something else was right, I would teach it that way, all right? You understand how those things go. People are open to being, uh, to having their minds change. I've told you this story before. Guy said to me one time, he said, Ross, the problem with you is that you just think you're right. I said, so do you think I'm wrong? Oh, yeah, you're wrong. Well, what would I need to do to be right? Agree with you? Yep, agree with me and you'd be right. And I said to the guy, the problem with you is that you just think you're what? Right. Everybody does this. Everybody does this. If you thought something you believed was wrong, you'd believe something else. Right? I mean, that's the way most logical, human, rational people behave. They believe things that they think are true unless or until further evidence, further study, further research tells them that, ah, uh, you're wrong about that. You need to sort of move the line, so to speak, on that point. Right? And I've said this before. What we need to be doing, guys, is we need to be pitching doctrinal tents, not erecting fixed structures. Now, what do I mean by that? If you pitch a doctrinal tent, you are able to pick it up and move it if further research, study, and evidence suggests that you, when you pitch it there, you put it in the wrong spot, you need to move it over here. But when you erect physical structures that are immovable, that cannot be moved, then what you end up doing is you just end up defending the, uh, the territory that you've staked out, and you sort of get entrenched, and you are no longer open to listening to other things. Is this making sense? I hope this is making sense. So we think about rightly dividing the word of truth. This is something that we need to be doing. It's something that we need to be affirming constantly. Now, I think you would all agree 
Every Sunday, am I up here talking about rightly dividing the word of truth every Sunday? Maybe I'm not using those exact words, but is an understanding of the Bible from a dispensational point of view always informing what is being preached on? Yes, because there's an underlying understanding. Ephesians 3, verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now, dispensational Bible study is not my idea. I did not make it up. Okay. <clears throat> Stam did not make it up. Baker did not make it up. Darby did not make it up. It was revealed by God Almighty through the pen of the Apostle Paul that we live in a time period called the dispensation of what? Grace. We further know from those verses that this dispensation of grace in verse 3 was a, the subject of a mystery that was hidden God, that had not been made known, that had not been revealed, that had not been disclosed until it was made known and manifest to and through the Apostle Paul. Drop down in the same chapter, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I am made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles. Here it is, the unsearchable riches of who? Now why does he call it the unsearchable riches of Christ? He calls it that because it was a mystery. It's not traceable. It's not trackable. You'll go through the whole Old Testament and you will never find anything about the dispensation of grace and the church, the body of Christ, that God is forming during this dispensation because it was the subject of a mystery, okay? And then if you go to chapter 2 of Ephesians, Paul gives us a basic framework for understanding time. Verse 11, <coughs> excuse me, wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time, that's time past, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God where? So if you look over here at the wall, I should have, I should have brought a digital copy to throw on the screen, but I, I didn't do that. I forgot to do that. There's a time period known as time pass where God is dealing with the nation of Israel. Israel has all of the advantages, okay? And then there's a subsequent time period. Look at verse 13, but now. So there's a contrast here. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, that's the Gentiles in time past, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make it himself of twain. How many is twain? Two, right? So the twain in the passage would be Jew and Gentile, right? Circumcision and uncircumcision. Back up in verse 11 and 12. For to make it himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Verse 16, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them that are nigh, that through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. And then if you go over to verse 7, it says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. Notice in Ephesians chapter 2, you have three time periods. You have time past, you have but now, and you have what? Now, isn't that, isn't that just earth-shattering news, right? When you think about time, what are the three classifications of time that we understand? Past, present, and what? Future. Well, that's, what, that's how the Bible is laid out. The Bible is laid out according to what was true in the past, what's true now, today, in the dispensation of grace, and what, what God will do where? In the future, in the ages to come, right? Now, some people, come with me if you would to Numbers 13. Some people think that this doesn't matter that, you know, eh, you know, you guys are just overemphasizing things. You don't, really need to, you don't really need to rightly divide the word of truth. And what I want to do for the rest of our time together this morning is I want to look at a practical example here out of the book of Numbers of the absolute necessity to rightly divide the word of truth, okay? 
Now, I'm sure you can all testify how many of you have been watching Christian TV, listening to Christian radio, <coughs> sitting in a church somewhere, and somebody tells you that you just need to claim every promise in the Word of God. Right? That anything you ask in faith whatsoever you believing it shall be what? Done for you, right? Name it, claim it. Health, wealth, and prosperity. Uh, you know, on and on and on and on. And the thing about all of that teaching is, is it in some way coming from the Word of God? When people talk about, you know, with tithes and offerings, shall a man rob God? And they put the, you know, the really high pressure on people as far as giving money. Is there a verse in the Bible that talks about that? Yeah, is there a verse, are there verses in the Bible that talk about whatsoever you ask in faith, believing it shall be done for you? Are there verses that say that? Right? There's, there, so we need to rightly divide the word of truth so that we can be ac accurately appropriating and applying to us in this dispensation what actually applies to us in this dispensation. When we go back and we try to pilfer Israel's time past program and try to bring stuff over and try to make it work, People get mad, they get upset, they get frustrated when the verses aren't working the way they were written to whom they were written to, all right? And then they make up excuses for why they're not working. Well, you didn't have enough faith, or you, you, know, you didn't really believe, or you know, maybe you haven't spoken in tongues yet, whatever the excuse is, okay? Even in Israel's program, so even in time past, did they need, still need to rightly divide the word truth? Okay, so let's look at a practical example of this. Numbers 13. So, the context of this, you'll recall the story. Israel has been in bondage for 400 years in Egypt. God sends who to Pharaoh to set the, to set the children of Israel free? He sends Moses, right? Moses, does Moses work the plagues and all that stuff happens and eventually after the Passover and the angel of death and the firstborn in Egypt is killed, does Pharaoh eventually agree to let the children of Israel leave? Yeah, and so the children of Israel leave Egypt and the first problem is the Red Sea, right? Pharaoh changes his mind and he sends his army after him and then Israel is caught between the Red Sea and the army of Pharaoh, right? And what does Israel do? Oh, Moses... We know that God has seen us this far. We have absolute faith and confidence that God will handle this situation as well. Is that what they do? No, they start whining and murmuring and complaining, right? And so does God part the Red Sea? Does he miraculously part the Red Sea? And does Israel cross on dry land? And then is the army of Pharaoh destroyed? Okay, I'm paraphrasing. I'm summarizing, okay? You understand what I'm doing here, right? And then they wander around for a little bit longer, right? And then they eventually end up at Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, Moses goes up into the mountain, and he's there too long. And so the people get all bent out of shape and upset, and they make a golden calf, and they start their own religion, and they do all this stuff. They haven't even been gone. They've already seen God work 10 plagues, 10 miraculous plagues in Egypt. They've seen him part the Red Sea, and they're already complaining, right? Well, eventually, do they end up on the border of the promised land, the land that has been promised to the nation of Israel and the patriarchs of the nation of Israel, and they send 12 spies in there to spy out the land? That's where we are right here. Let's jump in here, Numbers 13, verse 26. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Para to Kadesh, now watch, and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation of and all, all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We have come unto the land whither thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and uh, and this is the fruit of it. So let's stop there. Did God promise Israel a land flowing with milk and honey? Had they sent the spies in there to spy out the land? Now the spies have come back, and are they giving a report? And are they accurately saying, listen, this, hey, this is a great land. It's flowing with milk and honey. Here's the fruit of the land. Verse 20, 28. Now watch what happens, though. Nevertheless, the people are strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, 
The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. So, yep, it's a great land, but there's a lot of danger in this land. Verse 30, and Caleb stilled the people before Moses had said, now watch, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. What does Caleb want to do? Caleb says, God promised us this land. We can, with God on our side, we can go up in there and we can possess the land. It doesn't matter how strong they are, how walled their cities are, how great their fortifications are. God promised us this land. Let's go what? Let's go take it. Verse 31. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Problem? Is there a problem here? Big problem. Okay? And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we, uh, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. So now do we have a problem? What's the problem? Has God promised them this land? Did God know who would be living and dwelling and occupying that land when he made them the land promise in the first place? He obviously did, right? And so now the children of Israel, they've been, they've, they've been led out of Egypt. They've, they've been taken to the precipice where they're getting ready to inherit their promise and their land grant promise. And now we've got an evil report. And is there an evil report given by 10 of these guys against the land? Okay. First, chapter 14, verse 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died where? Just think about everything that's happened so far. Has God worked ten miraculous plagues to see them out of Egypt? Has he seen them miraculously through the Red Sea? Have they heard the voice of God thundering on Mount Sinai? Has God supernaturally provided for them by giving them manna to eat and all these sorts of things, right? And here they are, they have an evil report, and what do they do? They murmur. Would to God, we should, God, wouldn't you just let us die in Egypt? That would have been better than this. Sounds like my teenage kids. Okay, you got more ice cream than me. Okay, all the children of Israel murmured, verse 2, against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would to God we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness? Now, you need to think about this and, and think real, real carefully about it. So much preaching today is calling for God to do the miraculous. And if God would just do this or just do that or move in this way or move here or zap this or zap that, then we would know. Then we would have the evidence that we needed that God was on our side or in favor of this or that or the other thing, right? And here you got a group that has seen umpteen miracles already and now they're faced with another situation and what's the first thing they do? They whine. They cry and murmur. Hold your hand there and come over to 1 Corinthians 10. You know, uh, it's easy to be hard on Israel, but there's a, Paul gives us a warning about this same thing. First Corinthians 10, <clears throat> verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud... Uh, we're under the cloud and all pass through the sea. That's talking about the 
uh, Exodus, right? Verse 2, and we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That just means they were identified with Moses, okay? Who led them on that Exodus journey? Moses did. Moses was God's spokesman. He was the leader of the people, right? Verse 3, and did eat the same spiritual meat, and did drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock uh, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown where? Now, we're going to see that in a minute in, in Numbers, okay? They were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things... All of those things, all the things we're reading about right now in the book of Numbers, okay? Notice what Paul says. He says there, verse 6, now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also what? See, there's a real tendency to just look down your nose at these Israelites for being whining crybabies, but the reality is, are we subject to the same thing? Okay? Okay? Verse 7, neither be ye idolaters as some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, we already read about that, as some of them murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for and samples that they, and they are written for our admonition um, upon whom the ends of the world are come. So, folks, even as members of the church, the body of Christ, living in the dispensation of grace, can we still act, think, function, and behave like those whining Israelites did? And those things were written for our examples, okay? We can look back to that and we can say, and we can use that as an example for us today living in the dispensation of grace. Come back to Numbers chapter 14. So that's what Paul's talking about. He's referring to stuff like this that we're in the middle of reading of here in Numbers 14. Verse 2, Numbers 14, verse 2, And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation and said unto them, Would to God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness. Verse 3, And wherefore hath the Lord... Now notice who they're blaming God. Notice how they blame God. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, and that our wives and our children should be prey. Were it not better for us to return where? What was it like for them in Egypt? They were slaves, man. They worked with hard labor. Pharaoh said, make bricks without what? Straw. Now here they are whining, we should just go back. It would be better if we went back there. Verse 4, and they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into where? They are fixing to have a mutiny here against Moses where they're going to pick a new leader and the new leader is going to take them all back where? To Egypt. Now, think about this from God's point of view. Verse 5, then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of whatever that guy's name is, which were of them uh, that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. Look at verse 8. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Who are the only two guys outside of Moses and Aaron who are willing to operate by faith? Joshua and Caleb. Had God already told them what his will was? His will was for them to go in and possess the land, right? If God can part the Red Sea, if he can feed them with manna, if he can lead them by a pillar of fire and a cloud, then can he certainly take care of a bunch of weak Gentile armies? Okay? So Joshua and Caleb are like, guys, God's promised us, this is our inheritance, act by faith, let's go in and possess the land. Verse 9, only rebel not ye against the Lord, Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. For their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Are Joshua and Caleb willing to operate by faith? Okay. 
But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. So what do they want to do to Joshua and Caleb? Stone them. Boy, you better think about that. Who are the guys speaking the truth? Joshua and Caleb. What does the rest of the group want to do to Joshua and Caleb? Stone them. Speaking the truth in the face of adversity is going to be one of the most difficult things that you ever do. Sound familiar? But all the congregation, verse 10, but all the congregation bade stone them with stones. And the, now watch, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. So God's like, I've had enough of this. I'm going to come down there. Now watch. And the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? Now watch. For all the signs which I have what? Folks, had they already seen all the necessary signs to believe what God said was true? The, the, the modern fixation of Christendom for a sign apart from this book is doubt, not faith. Israel, the sign people. The Jews require a sign, Paul says in 1 Corinthians. The Israel, the sign people, have they already seen all the signs? And God shows up and he goes, how long am I going to have to deal with this, guys? How long am I going to have to deal with their unbelief, their whining, and when are they going to believe me for all the signs that I have, that, that I have showed among them? How long? Verse 12, and I will smite them, this is God talking still, with the pestilence and disinherit them. Whew. Is God mad? And disinherit them and will make of thee, Moses, will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. So what is God wanting to do here in this passage? He's wanting to start over. He's, I'm going to kill all these guys. I'm going to take you, Moses. I'm going to make a new nation out of you. And you're going to be mightier and better than these fools here. Now, I don't, you know, that's my interpretation, fools, okay? Verse 13, now watch Moses. And Moses said unto the Lord, then the Egyptians shall hear it. So understand. What did God say he wanted to do? Wipe them out and do what? Start over. Now who talks in verse 13? Moses. Now watch the authority that Moses speaks to God with here. And Moses said unto the Lord, then the Egyptians shall hear it. For thou, you, God, thou brought us up, thou brought us up, this people, in thy might from among them. That would be from among the Egyptians. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. For they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, and thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and thou, <coughs> sorry, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them, and Day to, uh, by daytime in a pillar of a cloud and in a pillar of fire by night. Now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the, uh, which have heard the fame of thee shall speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he sware unto them, therefore hath he slain them in the wilderness. Notice what Moses is doing. Is Moses pleading? Is Moses reasoning with God Almighty on the basis of God's word? Had Moses, sorry, had God promised Israel that land? Had God gone before Moses into Egypt and, and uh, the Egyptians freed the children of Israel based upon the testimony of Moses as a spokesman for who? For God. And so Moses turns to God and he says, listen, Lord, you can't do this. Because if you do this, you will give all of these nations an opportunity to gainsay against you. That's what he's saying. 
Verse 16, because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he swore unto them. Therefore hath he slain them in the wilderness. Now look at verse 17. Moses is still talking in verse 17. And now I beseech thee. Moses beseeches God. It's a fascinating thing. We don't have time to study it, but you should run the references on this. In the Old Testament, men beseech other men. And men beseech God as Moses is doing right here in this context. But in Paul's epistles, in the dispensation of grace, God beseeches us. Verse 17, And now I beseech thee, let the power <coughs> of my Lord be great, according, thou, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering. Now, now, what's Moses doing here? Is Moses quoting scripture to God that God wrote? That's what he's doing. So God says, hey, I'm going to come down there and tell you what I'm going to do, Moses. I'm sick of these clowns. They whine, cry. They're a bunch of babies. When are they going to believe me? Look at all the signs. Here's what we'll do. I'm going to kill all of them, and I'm going to start over with who? You. And Moses says, you can't do that. Reason number one you can't do that is because you'll give all these Gentile nations out here an opportunity to gainsay against you. But there's a greater reason why God can't do that, and it's because of this book. It's because of the promise of God's word to Israel. If God takes this group, even though he's upset with them and kills them all and starts over, would he be breaking his covenant promise that he made to the patriarchs? So watch what Moses does. Verse 18. No, verse, you need this, verse 17. And now I beseech thee, let the power of the Lord be great according, here it is, according as thou hast what? So Moses is going to plead the word of God here to God Almighty. Okay? The Lord Jesus Christ, when he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, what did he take refuge in? Human viewpoint or the word of God? The word of God. Verse 18, the Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, <coughs> upon the third and fourth generations. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according unto thy greatness of thy mercy, as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Moses is like, come on, God. It's not like you haven't been forgiven them the whole time. And if you're going to not forgive them now, you're going to give these nations an opportunity to gainsay against you. And oh, by the way, you'll be breaking your what? Your word. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy what? Folks, let me just tell you something. That this, is, this to me is one of the greatest passages in the word of God about the absolute integrity that God has to his word. Moses makes an argument and he beseeches God and he says, listen, you can't do this. And the reason you can't do this is because what you said over there. And you said that over there, and if you break it now, then you're not a man of your word. The Gentile nations will gainsay you. And when Moses does this and he beseeches the Lord, does God basically say to Moses, yes, you're right. Verse 20, and the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy what? To thy word. But now, that doesn't, he pardoned. But that doesn't mean there's still not going to be a consequence for their unbelief. Right? So, God has pumped the brakes on destroying the entire kit and caboodle of them and starting over. But is there still going to be a consequence for their unbelief? Verse 21. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men, which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land, which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them provoke me to see it. So notice, has, has he changed his mind about what he's going to do? 
Instead of destroying all, he's like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this generation that didn't operate and walk by faith, and I'm going to do what? I'm going to forbid them from seeing what? The land. Verse 24, but my, but my servant Caleb, <coughs> because he had another spirit with him and had followed me fully, him will I bring into the land uh, whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley. Tomorrow turn you and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Now, here's what I want you to think about. When they woke up on that morning, what was God's will for them? God's will for them was to go in there and to possess the land. And when God, and when God as a man of war, had gone before them to make sure that they got what he promised them they would have. But now what's happened? They woke up in the morning. Has the situation changed? Why has the situation changed? Has the situation changed because God has changed? Or because the children of Israel are operating in unbelief? Okay, now we'll come back to that in a minute. Verse 26. And the Lord uh, spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they have murmured against me, saying to them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, As ye have spoken in mine ear, so will I, so will I do it to you. Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless shall ye not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of whatever his name is, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, which ye said shall be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in the wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years to bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of days in which ye search the land, even forty days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities. Even forty years ye shall know the breach of, my, uh, the breach of promise." I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed, and there they shall die. And the men which Moses sent to search the land, who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a, by bringing up a slander upon the land, these men that did bring up the evil report unto the land died by the plague before the Lord. I take that to mean that God strike them dead in that moment. So that how many spies were sent in? Twelve, one for each of the twelve tribes of Israel, right? How many of them believe God? Two, Joshua and Caleb, right? Now the rest of the ten struck dead here as a result of their evil slanderous report that they brought up against the land. How do I know? Look at verse 8. But Joshua, contrast, but Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of whatever his name is, which are of the men that went in to search the land, lived what? Still. Those ten guys are are smited there and they die for their slanderous report. Now watch. And Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. Stop there. So has the plan changed? Has the plan changed? Yeah. Why has the plan changed? The plan changed because of the unbelief of who? Israel. When they woke up that morning, if they had operated by faith, was God more than willing and able to take them across the Jordan and possess the land? Yeah. But because of the evil slanderous report of the ten, the children of Israel murmur against the Lord. 
The Lord has it in his mind first that he's going to smite them all and start over with Moses. Moses pleads Israel's cause according to the word of God and according to the reputation of God among the Gentile nations. And does God back off? He backs off of killing them all and starting over, but does he judge the ones who are of age who believe the slanderous report? Okay. Now, look at verse 30. No, sorry, verse 40. <coughs> no, verse 39. And Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. Now look at the next verse. And they rose up early in the morning. So it's the next day now. And got them up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and we will go up unto the people which the Lord hath promised, for we have what? So what are they doing on, on, on day two? See, they don't like how day one ended up, do they? They don't like how day one ended up at all, right? And so do they go up now on day two claiming the promise of day one? And when they go up on day two to, to proclaim the promise of day one, how's that going to go for them, as we'll see in a minute? Well or not well? Not well. Now, what a difference a day makes. When they woke up in the morning of day one, could they have gone in and had the land? But because of their unbelief and their murmuring, et cetera, the the plan changed, not because God changed, but because of their unbelief, God's going to judge those two, that generation, everybody 20 and older. And so now now they go up on the morning of the next day, they go up on the morning of day two to claim the promise of day one. Verse 40. And so they rose up, early in the morning, and got them to the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and will go unto the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. Verse 41, And Moses said, Wherefore now do ye transgress the commandment of the Lord, but it shall not prosper? Do you understand what's going on? They are literally on day two going up to claim the promise of day one, And Moses says, now listen, guys, you guys here on day two, you're transgressing the commandment of God. Why? Because that God changed the way he was dealing with these people based upon their behavior. Yes. Verse 41, and Moses said, wherefore now do ye transgress the commandment of God, or sorry, the commandment of the Lord, but it shall not prosper. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you that ye be not smitten before your enemies. Would God have gone with them on the previous day? But now he's not with them. And here they are in day two claiming the promise of day one. And Moses says, if you do that, you will do it to your own destruction. Because God's not in it anymore. You following this? Okay. Verse 42, go not up, for the Lord is not among you that ye be not smitten before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword, because ye are turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. Look at the next verse. And they agreed with Moses and praised the Lord and stopped their plans. No. But they presumed to go up unto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Then the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites which dwelt in the land and smote them and discomforted them even unto Hormah. What a difference a day makes. Okay, now we live today in the dispensation of grace. Thank God. So, when, when, when believers today claim the promises of a, another, of a different day or of a previous dispensation, does God like smite them dead and so forth? No, because we're in the dispensation of grace. But there's a lesson here that I want you to think about. Here's Israel on day two, claiming the promise of what? Literally one day before would they have had their way with the Amalekites. 
But now here they are on day two. God has changed the situation because of their unbelief. And here they are on day two claiming the promise of the day before. This is exactly what denominational Christianity is doing with the word of God. So there's an object lesson here for us about the absolute necessity to rightly divide the word of truth. When Israel goes on day one, day two, to follow the instructions of day one, it works to their utter disaster. There are believers today that are claiming things out of the word of God, out of Israel's time past program, and trying to make them work today in this dispensation to their utter frustration, bewilderment, discouragement, and even departing the faith. So while God's not going to smite you and I dead in this dispensation, will there be a spiritual cost in your, in your spiritual life to trying to operate and function as somebody that you're not? Let's operate in day two instructions, not day one instructions. So there's an absolute object lesson for us here in this story from the Old Testament from Numbers 13 and 14 about why we need to rightly divide the word of truth, why we need to be dispensational in our approach to Bible study. Why we need to take the command seriously to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Folks, I know people in my personal life and in my family that are, that are so dejected and upset and mad and angry with God because God's not doing for them what they think God should be doing. And the reason they think God should be doing these things is because the things they think God should be doing are in the Bible. They're just not rightly dividing the Bible. So they're taking things from day one and trying to apply it on day two, and it's not what? It's not working. And so instead of scratching the head and saying, hmm, maybe I need to rethink this, no, they get mad at who? They get mad at God. Why this and why that and why is this happening and not this way and so on and so forth, right? There's going to be a cost in your spiritual life to not heeding the commandment to rightly divide the word of truth. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I hope this makes sense to you. We need to affirm these things constantly, folks. Folks, I say things sometimes. Listen, I think the adv- I feel sorry for a lot of folks because they have so bought into the web of lies and false doctrines that the adversary has put in their way and lied in wait for this to deceive them in. It's not that I'm so smart or we're so smart or anything like that. The only thing that we have done is we have had care to try to follow what God says and rightly divide what? The word of truth. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Who we'll have all men to be saved and what? Come to the knowledge of what? Dispensational Bible study and rightly dividing the word of truth is absolutely essential to to you and I living a mature Christian life. To not be operating on day two in the instructions from day one. You following that illustration? Next Sunday, as I've already said, uh, brother, Brother Will is going to be delivering the message. And um, we're going to be enjoying some, uh, some time away. But this whole thing about dispensational Bible study and rightly dividing the word of truth, this is important stuff, okay? Because it's God's book. We need to approach it and study it the way God says to study it. And when we do, we'll get the profit out of it that he's put there for us. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time. We're grateful for All these folks that have gathered here this morning to hear your word preached. We pray that it will be edifying and encouraging. We pray for uh, Brother Will as he prepares for next week. Pray that uh, he'll have encouragement from your word. Grateful for all the things they've done for us, for all the saints and families that comprise this local church. Grateful for all all the blessings that we have in Christ. 